The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Superwoman Wellness, where you know that on every episode of the show, I am determined to bring you back to your superpower self. Joining me today is Ellen Satter. Uh, Ellen is an internationally recognized authority on eating and feeding, something we can all use a little bit of help with. Satter, Ellen created the Division of Responsibility and Feeding, which is considered the gold standard for feeding children. Satter's What is Normal Eating is a refrigerator door and social media icon. Satter is a dietitian, a family therapist, an author, a trainer, a publisher, and a consultant. So she doesn't do anything. During her over 40-year clinical career, she worked first as a registered dietitian in outpatient medical practice, then as a psychotherapist in private practice specializing in family-based treatment of eating disorders. She began her writing and speaking career in 1983 with the publication of Child of Mine, Feeding with Love and Good Sense. Satter is the foundation of the Ellen Satter Institute. Welcome to the show, Ellen. I'm so pleased to have you on. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Taz. It's fun to be here. It'll well, be interesting to see where we go with this conversation. Uh, it is interesting to see where we go. I don't know anyone who doesn't have issues with eating and feeding and caring for themselves or for the people that they love. Why do we have so much angst around eating and so much internal dialogue around it? I mean, I see it all the time in the exam room. I see it, you know, with my family, but it's, it's just a very, very common problem now. Um, well, that's how I got into this racket with the Division of Responsibility and Feeding and the Eating Competence, because um, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, so I'm old, Dr. Taz, you won't tell me, tell us your age, but <laughs> I, I'm 77, I, I've been around the block a few wow. times. And so one of the best things that I can say about myself is I always know if I'm doing it wrong. You know, and I'm always willing to go back to the drawing board and and work out something different. So right. when I got started as a registered dietitian in an outpatient medical setting, um, I began to realize that I was teaching people my nifty diets, and I was making them miserable mm -hmm. because they would mm -hmm. come in enjoying eating and and cooking and having food and eating be such a joyful and positive part of their lives. And I teach them my diets. I tell them to lose weight or cut down on their cholesterol or follow a diabetic diet or don't eat so much salt. And a few weeks they, later, they'd come back and they were miserable. Yeah. You know, they'd lost their joy in eating. They were second guessing themselves about everything they ate. They were trying so hard to adhere to my diet um, that they, they were they were just, <laughs> they were stuck, you know, they were right. just immobilized. They, they didn't know what to eat. And, and, and I think that's what you're just, what I experienced in my clinical setting is what we're Very experiencing much. in a broader microcosm or a broader, you know, the whole world is like this now. And there's so many do's and don'ts. It's all about good food, bad food. Right. Um, and so, and over the years, and I can give you the bits and pieces, the segues, if we feel like it's helpful or important, but I've discovered that positive eating has more to do with eating attitudes and behaviors mm. than it does with um, what we do and don't eat, with good and bad food, with right and wrong food, that um, getting ourselves to eat certain amounts and types of food is just plain wrecking things for us. Whoa, you just blew up like every meal plan, every diet plan, every, you know, all this energy and effort that we put into our macros and our micros and our I know it. meal delivery services. And so, well, you know, it's all about getting fed. And if, you know, the macros and micros and meal delivery services and understanding about food composition, all that helps us to get fed. And if we enjoy what we're eating, then it's all to the good. Hmm. Eating competence is all about, well, I, I, I'll rewind in a minute and tell you what eating competence is. But eating competence is all about feeding yourself faithfully 
and giving yourself permission to eat. So it's a matter of reassuring yourself that you are going to be fed. That when you get up in the morning, you have an idea for your day when you're going to get to eat. And I know you have busy days, but it's a matter of sort of outlining for yourself, when and where will I eat in the morning? Mm -hmm. When and where will I break up my day somewhere in the middle and have something to eat? When and where am I going to eat in the evening before I go to bed? So that is, is really just critical. If we, um, we, we have to reassure ourselves that we're going to be fed. And then once you decide what you're going to eat, it's a matter of, of uh, really thinking about what you enjoy, what is rewarding for you. If you're going to put the effort into having a meal, the, um, the juice has to be worth the, the squeeze. Right, right. So, um, and sitting down at the meal, giving yourself permission, paying attention when you eat. So going back to these clinical days, and so I started asking myself, okay, you know, they, they were better off before they ever saw me. So what were they doing when they came into my office? And I began to uh, wonder about that. And I would, I, I would pay attention. What were they doing? Well, they were having meals. Mm -hmm. they, they had food mastery. They knew about food. They knew how to get food. They were cooking they were enjoying meals with their friends, um, and they felt good about it. You know, it was very positive attitudes about eating, and they were trusting themselves to eat as much as they were hungry for. And their body weights were pretty stable until I started messing around with them and getting them to try to lose weight. Their body weights stayed about the same. They didn't go up. They didn't mm -hmm. go down. Working with me, their weights went down, then they went back up again, right. and then they tried to force them down, then they went up again. So, well, over the years, I developed these observations into a model, and as time went on, I even had a name for it, it was called the Satter Eating Competence Model. Okay. Um, and I really systematized it by creating a test, um, which I called the sadder eating confidence test. <laughs> <laughs> Love the originality there. Just for creativity. Love it. <laughs> aren't, I, aren't I just the smartest thing? Yes. Love it. Um, Love and it. so, but you know, it sounds awfully egotistical, but I put my name on these models to protect right. them because um, nutritionists and dietitians and other health professionals like the eating competence model, they like the division of responsibility and feeding, but they just can't wrap their heads around the idea that you have to divorce it from having to eat certain amounts and types of food. So everybody messes with it. Right. You know, everybody says, eat this, eat that, and be eating competent. And so, and I say, no, 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 that's not what it's about. You know, in this 15 item test, this eating competence inventory, there are questions about your attitudes relative to your eating. Part of eating competence is um, having regular meals and snacks, having real, uh, meals and snacks at more or less predictable times that work for you. And then we have attitude. That's the second question. I'm comfortable with my enjoyment of food and eating. Right, right. And then we have uh, food acceptance skills. And that's where I experiment with new food and learn to like it. Exactly, exactly. And then you have food regulation. And I eat as much as I am hungry for. And that's exactly. a big one that I feel like a lot of people struggle with. So, Well, they do struggle because, and do you know why they struggle? No, that's why I have you on the show. I think you can figure it out. I think you can figure it out because they have an idea about how much they should weigh. Ah. And so you really don't dare eat as much as you're hungry for because you might end up weighing something that you don't want to right. weigh. Right. Although I found in my work with people as I help them dig themselves out about of all this distortion and their eating attitudes and behaviors and get back to eating competence, I find that people weigh about the same. Hmm. They don't lose weight. They don't gain weight. Something we do know in our research with eating competence, and because we have the test, we can do research with it, we find that people's weights tend to be stable and a little lower 
than for people who are eating competent than those who aren't eating competent. And that makes sense because I think putting, you know, the schedule to place is really important. People forget to eat, don't eat, don't mm -hmm. think about food before they leave the house. That's I right. find that to be a big one. And then you're caught because you're starving and then you go eat everything in sight and then That's right. the hunger centers off and all that other stuff. So there's that. But I think, you know, how do you reconcile being eating competent where you establish structure, you and try to enjoy the experience of eating, which is what the Europeans, I feel like, do such a great job with. You're trying new foods, but you may still be devoid of nutrients or, or eating something that maybe the body itself does not tolerate. How do we reconcile those concepts? Well, uh, let's go back. Let's revert to talking about children because this concept yeah. is a little easier to yeah. understand with children. The, the guiding principle that I develop for children is the division of responsibility in feeding. That parents do the what, when, and where of feeding. They provide the structure, they, they figure out the menu, they make sure that mealtimes happen, they keep mealtimes comfortable. And then they turn over to their children. They trust their children to do the what and how much of eating. Mm -hmm. to decide to determine kids don't it isn't intellectual for kids it's, right uh, they determine how much to eat and whether or not to eat and kids over time as parents put meals on the table over time children gradually learn to eat the food that their parents eat and they start out by eating the food that is the least challenging, the most accessible, maybe carbohydrate foods, maybe high fat foods. You know, did you ever see a kid who didn't eat like a cookie the first time he mm -hmm. ate it, but the new vegetable, you know, it takes 15 or 20 times to learn to like right. it. So ever so gradually, kids learn to eat a variety of food, but they don't eat the same thing all the time. There is a process called sensory specific satiety mm -hmm. where children tire of even favorite foods and will eat something different. Mm -hmm. And so within them, the same as they learn and grow with, with walking, with reading, um, they learn and grow with their eating attitudes and behaviors, with their food acceptance. If they're exposed to a variety, then they gradually learn to eat a variety. Mm. And we do the same thing. If we um, feed ourselves faithfully and give ourselves permission to eat foods that we enjoy in mounts we have satisfying, that we too tire of familiar and preferred food. And over time, we seek variety. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's a natural process that comes from within us is simply the way we are and so over time we eat an increasing variety of food and which is of course variety is the is the most nutritious diet right plus variety is a good strategy if you're eating a variety of food that you're getting you have the best chance of getting what you need mm -hmm. and the least chance of overdosing on something that's not so good for you and so you trust yourself then to learn and grow. And it all grows out of this, this um, awareness of what goes on inside of you about your, your appetite. You know, appetite is compelling, but it can be satisfied. Hunger is compelling, but it's the same thing. It can be satisfied. How do you though, so, you know, so it sounds like to be eating competent and to teach our children as well, the same skills so that they go into adulthood properly. It's again, uh, creating the structure of eating, thinking about it, planning for it, creating an experience around eating that's enjoyable and, and fulfilling and sustaining rather than rushed or running through a drive through or something like that. And then introducing a variety of foods. Now life gets in the way. And people are rushing and running around, no matter what role they're playing, you know, how, how do we maintain eating competence in this incredibly busy, overscheduled life? You know, what is, what's your recommendation? Because, you know, what you're saying is clearly it's the experience. And we've seen these studies before where a hamburger, you know, 
uh, eaten on the run on the way to catch a plane is metabolized differently than a hamburger where you're sitting outside on the beach with your family and enjoying it and savoring every bite. They're metabolized completely differently in the body. So how, but how in the reality of day-to-day -day life, how does one reconcile some of this? Are there some very easy practical steps that you would give a busy mom or a busy executive, you know, um, who feels like they don't have control over eating for themselves and feels like they also don't have control over eating for their family? Well, the first thing you have to do is get over this idea that you have to have a healthy home cooked meal. It's about structure. Mm, so structure and is the most important. It's structure. Wow. And so you, you begin to build the meal habit. Well, even in these busy days, you know, where you're running, running, you feed yourself. Mm -hmm. You grab a bite here, you grab a bite there, you, you know, you swing by the counter, you pick something up. And so you're eating, but what is missing is structure. And so to begin with structure, eat what you're eating now, just organize it into meals. So if you have a cup of coffee mid-morning, if you grab a donut on the way into the office, maybe a coffee later, maybe some cheese that's lying around that somebody uh, has for their lunch. And instead of, you know, nibbling along here and there, you just bring it all together. So you have a lunch of a donut, coffee, and some cheese. But then so you sit down, you pay attention to it. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of strange, but sitting down makes it a meal. So and the structure and the experience almost comes first. And it, then, absolutely. And then the food quality right. and the food um, piece right. of it. And is that enough for people? If they create the structure and they create the experience, do you find that people typically eat less and enjoy what they're eating or their metabolism is different? What do you find? Well, the, the, our studies show that people who are competent with eating, who who score high on mm -hmm. the ECSI, the Eating Competence Inventory, do better medically. They do better, they have better lab tests. You mm -hmm. know, their blood lipids and their blood pressures are better. They, uh, their weights are the same or lower. They, they even do better socially and emotionally. And they do better nutritionally. You know, they have a higher quality diet, which means they, they sort of live up to the standards of the dietary guidelines, and they also have a nutritionally adequate diet. So it's a matter that Ooh. you start you start with structure, yeah, and you start with giving yourself permission to eat, and you let it take you uh, where you need to go in terms of health and dietary quality. Wow, guys, for all of you busy superwomen rushing around and supermen that might be listening to the show this is this is a game changer for us right because we're so used to intellectualizing our food and trying to be perfect with it or trying to provide the right type of food for ourselves or for our family and i brought ellen on the show but she just disrupted that whole thought so oh, here's maybe, hoping <laughs> no so a very important point but we may not be eating competent we might be eating and trying to eat healthfully but may not be eating competently. So that's a novel way to think. It's a change. It's something different. Do you have structure in your day with your food? I mean, I can be honest and answer and look Ellen in the eye and say, I don't, you know, I mean, I have, you know, I do my intermittent fasting. I have my morning shake that breaks the fast. I have a three-ish snack slash meal. I guess I do have structure then. We do have dinner, a consistent dinner, but you throw travel in and you throw a few flights and throw some deadlines in and that might easily get disrupted even as much as I know about food. So, so there's just a great reminder, you know, for all of us that it's so important to be eating competent and to carry that in to our families as well. Well, you know, you have to make eating a priority in order for it to turn out well. Very true. And so you're not a big one to make people cook, like get them in the kitchen or all that other stuff. You don't feel like that's where the emphasis needs to be. Well, you know, the food is going to take them there. If you mm. let yourself eat food you enjoy, you're over time, you're going to become curious about food. You're going to, to think in terms of, you know, where can I get food that I truly enjoy? Uh, 
some people really don't cook. They don't enjoy it, but others really do cook and they right. enjoy it a lot. In fact, there's a, there was a study that was done in Minneapolis with parents about what got in the way of their having family meal time. And the parents said time, same as you're saying, it's mm -hmm. time. And they, and they said things like, you know, when I have time to cook a healthy meal, then we all sit down together and we have a family meal. But if we have fast food, that we don't sit down together and eat that. That's when everybody goes off into their own place and eats separately. Wow. And I thought, what? You know, are you only going to be reverent about your food? Are you only going to treat it re with respect if it's healthy and home cooked and you've done a lot of, uh, uh, taking a lot of time and effort to make it? Why not sit down together with that fast food meal? I mean, that food is as deserving of reverence and ritual as the so-called healthy food. Right. So ritual is something I think that we could all bring back into our lives and into our family lives. I know that we have, as a family, made a concerted effort to have that family dinner at least every you. night. And it's such an opportunity. And it's interesting because at first the kids were like, okay, I'm done. I'm out. I'm like, oh, no, no, we're, we're having a conversation here. And so it's, it's just important to, to stick to some of these rituals within a family. I think it really changes the dynamic of the family and it really changes the experience of everybody's day. So that's something that our family has worked really, really hard on. But I know so many families that don't because sports and other things uh, oh, take precedence and it, dis it disrupts it. Are you worried about the rising childhood obesity? Well, uh, yes, of course. And who isn't? But I see it coming from a different place. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, the, the general advice or the way of thinking about and working with childhood child obesity is restriction and avoidance, same as for adults. And so you purge the house of sweets and you try to, you know, get kids to eat lots of vegetables. So that's the conventional way of, of doing it. And I, I, and I find that when parents do that, kids become food preoccupied and are prone to eat more when they get the chance rather than less. So mm. the typical advice about child obesity is, um, counterproductive. It really makes the problem worse, not better. And it, instead of that, it's so important for parents to maintain a division of responsibility and feeding and let and trust even the large child to eat as much as they want of food they enjoy at mealtime and at structured snack time, but not let uh, them graze for food or beverages in between times. I've written a book on the topic. It's called Your Child's Weight, Helping Without Harming. And it's all about setting up a, a positive relationship around children of all sizes, maintaining a division of responsibility, letting them grow up to get bodies that are right for them, and supporting them and being emotionally healthy at whatever weight they are. You know, if a child is uh, especially large or especially small, they need better than average social skills in order to be able to be successful in life. They need good character and common sense and the ability to cope with problems. And so that's where you put your efforts, not in trying to change your child's body. Wow. Message for our parents out there. I hope you guys are listening. I know uh, many, many people out there worry about their child's weight and fixate on it or vice versa. You're not worried about weight. You're worried about the quality of food they're eating and we fixate on that. So I think this is a, such a great reminder of going back to the basics of nurturing and emotional connection and experience honestly slowing down a little bit it might not mm -hmm. hurt all of us and really well, enjoying I, the experience of food. And I certainly wouldn't want to come out, come across as being critical of anybody for the way they eat and they manage their food. And I certainly wouldn't want to be critical of parents for the way they feed their children because we all do the best we can. Right. And this, but the problem is that the soup we are swimming in right now with respect to our to our attitudes about food and this whole culture of avoidance is, is really causing us a lot of problems mm -hmm. with respect to our, our health, our relationship with food, our relationship with our kids. 
Valuable information for all of us. Goodness gracious, thank you so much. So create structure, create an experience, limit grazing and snacking, try new foods. These are all a part of the Saturn eating competence model. Wait Correct? a minute. Did I Wait forget a minute. something? Uh, trust yourself to get interested in a greater variety of food. Trust so yourself. Don't to make get, yourself. Don't make yourself. Trust yourself to get trust interested. Yourself. I love you know, it. It's amazing how how easily all this sort of controlling stuff Star, uh, starts. The dialogue this, starts. This rah rah. You've got to change this. You've got to change that. Yeah. Are we wrapping up? Because I want to give a couple of search. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want? You want to make sure we all know. Go for it. All right. Well, I've written a number of books on the topic of eating and feeding. Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family is the one about eating competence. Mm -hmm. um, and I already talked about your child's weight, helping without harming. And um, Child of Mine, Feeding with Love and Good Sense is about feeding birth through about uh, preschool. Your listeners can find me and find the Ellen Satter Institute by doing a search for eating competence. And it's Google's beautifully. I mean, it comes up with the mm -hmm. Ellen Satter Institute first. And Division of Responsibility as another nifty search. Okay. And so they'll be able to find their way to to me and my colleagues at the Ellen Satter Institute, we have a faculty of about 13 people who, who work with eating competence and feeding dynamics. So if people are looking for health in that, help in that area, they can find their way to us. And I, I think we have something that could be helpful to for them. It's the Ellen Satter Institute for everybody listening today. Uh, Google is the best way to find you. Go to the Ellen Satter Institute. Do you have a website URL that you want to direct everyone to? It's www.ellensatterinstitute.org. Okay. Ellen with a Y. And Ellen so, with a Y. I think the other, other search is just as well. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful uh -huh. information, really shifting the paradigm for us, changing the way we think when we talk health and wellness and trying to be your super powered self. Thank you so much for joining this episode of Superwoman Wellness. And for everybody else, remember that the show is now on Spotify as well. So please rate and review it and share it with your friends. I will see you guys all next time.